In this video, we're going to take an in-depth look at the soft synths and instruments included with Sona X3 Producer Edition. Although there's some crossover, they can be broadly divided into two types. First, they are the instrument type. They mimic or reproduce the traditional instruments such as drums, guitar, piano, etc. The other types are the synthesizers that create sounds using oscillators, filters, envelopes and LFOs to produce a more electronic sounding instrument. I'll use the term soft synth and instrument interchangeably through these videos. There's no difference in how they are inserted and routed, although some have more audio outputs and use more MIDI channels than others. All that we covered later when we take a look at each one in turn. We'll also take a good look at the basics of MIDI and synths, for example, what the jargon such as LFOs, ADSR envelopes and oscillators mean. We'll look at how a synth signal is routed to produce the sounds. So let's get on with some of the basics and we'll start by inserting a soft synth into Sona and look at the various track options. Probably the easiest way to find and insert the soft synths in Sona is to use the plugin browser. Press B to show that if it isn't already visible and click on the plugins tab to bring that to the front. Here you'll see the instrument button. Click on that to show a list of instruments loaded on your system. I'm going to click drag TTS1 across to the track view and then release. At this point, we're asked a few setup questions. What tracks do we want Sona to create for us, if any? The simple instrument track option creates one track that displays the MIDI lane but plays back the audio. This is just a MIDI track and an audio track associated with the synth output combined. The MIDI source option creates a MIDI track with its output pre-assigned to the synth. Synth track folder will create a folder for all of the various tracks associated with the synth. First synth audio output creates an audio track for the synth first output. Usually, it's the main output, while there are also choices for all synth audio outputs, both stereo and mono, which create the relevant track for each synth output. I'll explain the synth outputs in more detail later. Some have multiple outputs, some just a single output. You'll hear me refer to these tracks as either synth track or instrument track. Many of these choices are mutually exclusive. For example, you can't create a simple instrument track and a MIDI source or audio output, as that wouldn't make any sense. The reasons for that I'll explain soon. We can choose whether to open the synth properties page or interface, or display the synth rack which is in the browser. Here you'll find all of the synths that are open in the project. Some synths are capable of generating MIDI data, and enable MIDI output if checked will allow that generated MIDI data to be rerouted, perhaps for recording onto another track. Although we won't be looking at automation in this video, it's possible to assign any track within the project to display any automation on. Using this, you could have several synths in a project with the automation for all of them on the same track. That may make editing automation easier. Recall assignable controls will automatically generate any assigned controls that you have previously assigned to that synth in the synth rack. Details of that are also beyond the scope of this video. For now, I'm going to just select the simple instrument track option and click OK. We now have the SIT or SIT created, that's just a simple instrument track, and it's assigned to TTS1. We can see TTS1 is present in the synth rack. I'm going to repeat that, but this time instead of creating a SIT, I'm going to create a MIDI track and the first audio output track. Some instruments have the capability of using multiple outputs. Many drum synths, for example, can output each kit piece to its own output for greater control. We'll look at that ability later, but if you want every output track created automatically, choose that option in the Insert Synth dialog. You'll see the two tracks appear, and also notice that another instance of TTS1 has been added to the synth rack. For some of the single channel soft synths, this is the only way to play two different sounds using the same synth. Each instance is assigned its own sound and output. As we'll see later though, some synths can output on up to 16 channels. We'll look at what all of that means shortly. Although I've used drag and drop for synth insertion, 
There are also track templates available from the track header right click context menu, which will insert the chosen synth and associated tracks. We looked briefly at the synth rack earlier, and synths can also be added here using the Add Synth button. So now let's take a look at some of the basics of MIDI. If you're new to MIDI, you may well find this section useful. If you're already fairly au okay fait with it, you might like to skip this part. So what is MIDI? MIDI is an acronym for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, which might be a little misleading, as MIDI can not only be used to control instruments, but can also be used to control other musical equipment, such as effects processors and even light units. But that's beyond this video. The most important thing to know is that MIDI is not sound. You can't hear it. MIDI is simply data, a set of instructions that can be sent to a synth or other piece of equipment that understands MIDI to control it. In the case of this video, we are interested in synths, and synths can follow these MIDI instructions to produce sound and produce the audio that we hear. Although it's beyond the scope of this video, MIDI can also be used to change sounds on synths. These different sounds are stored within the synths as banks and patches. We'll be looking at those in a little bit more detail later. The MIDI data we're most interested in for the purpose of the video is the note data. This data can include what note, how hard to play it, how long for, and how much more. I guess the next question would be, where does this data come from? It can be generated by MIDI keyboard or controller and played in real time, or it can be stored as data on a SIT or MIDI track and played that way. That leads us nicely onto the tracks themselves. We'll take a look at the separate MIDI and associated audio track first. In my setup, I use different colored track names to make it easier to differentiate track types. The MIDI track is green, the associated synth or instrument track is blue, and simple instrument tracks are pink. The MIDI track is the starting point. This is where the MIDI data is recorded onto or played through if using a keyboard. You can also drag MIDI clips onto it. Let's take a quick look at the setup. The first thing I want to mention is Input Echo. This is the button to the right of the Mute, Solo and Record buttons. This controls whether the track responds to the incoming MIDI data of a controller or not. To make the track respond, it needs to be lit, and depending on your preferences, it may be turned on automatically when a track is given focus. If not, it can be turned on or off by clicking on it. Now's a good time to talk about MIDI ports and channels. A port is just a term used to refer to each separate MIDI device. Note that some pieces of equipment have more than one MIDI port, effectively meaning there are two or more devices in one and can be used as such. For example, my PCR keyboard has two ports. One is used for transmitting note data from the traditional piano keyboard, allowing me to play synths. The other is used for transmitting control surface data from its sliders and knobs, allowing me to control sonar or the synth controls with that section. The MIDI definition allows up to 16 channels, so each port can have up to 16. Each channel is independent from the other. This makes it possible for some synths to play back 16 different sounds or parts all at the same time. Note though that some synths can only use one channel. Although on multi-channel synths, any channel can be used for any part, traditionally, drums use channel 10. These channels can be very useful. For example, your keyboard might be capable of being split allowing you to play one channel on the right hand and a different one on the left. Next comes the input. This is where we assign what the track responds to. Omni is the term used to mean all, so in this case this track will respond to any MIDI controller and any MIDI channel. In my setup I have four keyboards as well as a drum machine with pads on it, and set on Omni it doesn't matter which one I play, the track will respond. Click on the list and it's possible to fine tune the input either to an individual controller by selecting that controller and its Omni option. Remember that Omni means all, and in this case refers to all channels. Alternatively, choose an individual controller and channel. All other controllers and channels will then be ignored. Because these tracks were created when the synth was inserted, the output's pre-assigned to that synth, in this case TTS1. It could be changed here if required though, and available MIDI ports are listed in the drop-down selector. What you see here will depend on your setup and how many SOS synths you have inserted in the project. We also have a channel selector. 
None will default to the channel that the incoming data is on. Select the required channel to change it. For most of this video, I'll be using channel 1 except for the drum machines or when demoing the multi-channel capabilities of some of the synths. That's followed by banks and patches. I've mentioned these briefly already. A patch is where a sound is stored by a synth. That might be a piano patch, or perhaps a guitar or some exotic sounding name such as Alpha Centuri, which is one of the factory patches in the Synth Zeta 2, which we'll look at later. Sometimes these patches might be referred to as program. Patches are grouped into collections or groups known as banks. A bank can typically hold up to either 128 or 256 patches. Some synths have lots of banks. Some might only have one. These two drop-downs are one way of changing the sound that some synths play. Some synths can only have patches and banks selected from within the synth and effectively ignore these controls. There is an effects bin that can be used to insert MIDI effects. To summarise then, the MIDI track is where the data originates from and it is then sent from here to the synth where it's translated into audio. The synth then outputs that audio to one of its outputs. We need an audio track for that output to come back to. This is where the synth or instrument track comes in. This is just an audio track whose input is assigned to a synth's output. In this case, it's pre-assigned because it was created when the synth was inserted. This track has all the usual audio track controls except the record button. Instead, where the record widget would usually be, there's an additional widget known as the waveform preview button. If this is turned on, a virtual waveform is generated in a track pane when the transport's running as a track plays back. There's also an output selector that allows us to set the output bus, be that to a downstream group bus or the master bus. This also has an effects bin, but this one is used to insert audio effects. To summarise the routing in this two-track MIDI and instrument track setup, the MIDI data originates from the MIDI track where the channel, bank and patch selection can be made. The data is assigned to the synth assigned by the track output. The synth uses the data to create sound and then plays it back via its outputs to a track called a synth track. Here we have further control over it. For example, we can control pan, volume or add audio effects. Finally, this track outputs the audio to a downstream bus. Now we've covered the MIDI and instrument track pair, let's take a look at a simple instrument track. The first thing you'll notice is that the SIT only takes up one track space vertically, whereas the MIDI and associated synth audio track take twice as much space. This is one of the advantage, and this height saving can soon add up if you have a project with lots of soft synths in it. The track still has an input echo button, and just like a MIDI track that needs to be lit if we want the track to respond to MIDI data from a controller or keyboard. The track itself displays any MIDI data present on the track. One of the disadvantages of a SIT is that the waveform cannot be previewed. There's an input drop down for input selection with exactly the same choices as found on a MIDI track. The output selector brings us to one of the differences between a SIT and the pair of tracks. A SIT output has the same output choice as an instrument audio track. This may leave you wondering how you'd change synths using a SIT, and the answer is you can't from the track view. We need to either open the inspector or split the track, which we'll look at shortly. The other selectors match these found on a MIDI track, namely channel, bank and pack. The effects bin here is for audio effects. To access the MIDI effects, we need to open the inspector. A SIT can be split into the MIDI and audio track pair. Right click on the header and select that option from the context menu. To create a SIT from the MIDI and audio track pair, right click on one of the tracks and select Make Instrument Track from the right click menu. To summarise then, a SIT hides much of the routing complexity while taking less vertical space, but the expense of less flexibility. Now let's move on to take a look at some of the instruments available. 